Yeah, right. there's like a film crew here this week right now to film like some uh, a little a little film like a portrait basically. So that's why this week I'm pretty busy filming with them, and we have to had to do that shoot that we're doing quite late um, at the gym. So mm-hmm. there's less people, and we can turn off the lights and all that. So that's why. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. I mean, that must be pretty common for you, though. I'm I'm imagining you keep a pretty packed schedule. Yeah, it's okay. Like, uh, I mean, I would say still the life of an athlete, it's still quite chill. Like, um, <laughs> my girlfriend is like a, a full-time worker, you know, so I definitely can't complain. I definitely have a lot more free time than she does. So, Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I bet. Yeah. Does she remind you like, man, you've got it pretty easy in the big, in the big scheme of things. She's going to work every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. She does, yeah. <laughs> right on. Well, yeah, man, we can just dive right in here. I'm ready to go. I'm already recording. Um, I edit the show, Perfect. so feel free to speak your mind. And, um, you know, if there's anything that we get into that feels, um, I don't know, too personal or whatever, just let me know. We can cut it out. That's no problem at all. Um, Perfect. But I don't, I, don't have any, I don't have any sneaky questions or anything. I'm not trying to... I mean, usually you. I'm a pretty open book. So unless you have anything <laughs> super crazy prepared, I think we'll be fine. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, Jakob, it is amazing to meet you, man. I've been really excited about this and um, I'm having the experience right now. I just spent like all of last night, you know, I've, I follow you on, on YouTube and stuff, but I spent a bunch of hours last night refreshing and, and watching a bunch of stuff. So I feel like we've been hanging out for the last you know, 12 hours or something um, last night and this morning, but it's great to meet you. And um, first off, I just want to congratulate you on what is probably like the best year that's ever happened in rock climbing. And it's, this is really fun timing because you've been sharing like your top five uh, accomplishments or experiences of, of 2023 on Instagram. And you're like on number three right now. So we've made it partway through that, but, but man, what a year. Uh, the world championships, you know, first off winning the world championships in lead and combine and qualifying for Paris all in one. So double world champion, like an, an amazing way to kick off the year. And then you sent two of the hardest deep water solos in the world with Espontis and Alasha in Mallorca. And then the first ascent of big, your first 9C. And then you did Alfane. You climbed your first V17, your first 9A boulder. So what a year. And I, my, my question is this. So looking at it from the outside, it feels like, it feels like you went into this year and you were like determined to prove to the world that you're the best climber alive. Like, did it, what actually happened? Like, did you have a goal of doing all these hard things and all these different facets of the sport or did it just kind of happen organically? Like, I mean, cause it's, it's not just all these amazing accomplishments, but it's sport, it's, you know, it's competition, deep water solo, sport climbing, bouldering all at the top level. Was that, was that, a goal going into this year? How did that unfold? So, yeah, I mean, first of all, thanks for the nice introduction, Stephen. And uh, yeah, it's good, good good to be on your podcast. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, I mean, definitely I had like a lot of goals coming into this year, of course. I mean, I've always been a very ambitious climber. I've always had my goals. I feel like also um, I was kind of lucky how I basically set it all up for this year because uh, I tried Alphane and also BIG already the year before, um, especially BIG. I did like a lot of work um, last year or now it's already two years ago um, uh, to make it possible to send it uh, in the same year as being like two times world champion and all that. Um, but yeah, I, I think I had like these three big goals, which would be like doing really well at the world championship, trying BIG and hopefully sending it and then spending all winter to try uh, Alfane. And um, it couldn't have been any better, obviously. I mean, especially the world championship was, I would say, the most un- um, almost the most unpredictable out of the three. Uh, you never know how it's going to go on a competition where everyone is trying to be in the best shape and uh, especially... The combined discipline just really went my way and mm. uh yeah i somehow was also in a perfect shape and really liked the atmosphere and burn and everything around it and i could really perform and basically really build up from that moment like gained so much confidence uh was also able to focus everything on rock climbing um because if i wouldn't have gotten the olympic ticket i would have still had to go to to the european qualifiers so it was just all like giving like hand going hand in hand, basically mm-hmm. like um, going to Flatanga with this crazy confidence, 
than being able to send PIG. So I can already focus on Alphane, you know. Um, uh, and yeah, to correct you, uh, Espontas and Alasha actually happened like way before. Uh, oh, it was okay. not the same year. Yeah. Yeah. We, we just published the videos this year or like 2023, but I did, I did it actually after the Olympics, 2021. Oh, okay. It's a while um, back. So yeah, that was actually, yeah, that was actually, um, we're kind of trolling some people, I guess, but I mean, you, you can find it out, but like, um, because we posted the videos, it maybe has come through that I did, did that this year as well. So yeah, that's, that's the only thing. I hope the year is still impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I'm not going to end the podcast. Yeah. Still, still a very impressive year. Um, and that makes sense. Those are really well produced videos. So I should have known, you know, that that stuff takes a lot of time. Um, but yeah, that makes a lot of sense, man. I was thinking about that. It seems like the world championship really was the thing that set everything else in motion because if you hadn't secured your ticket to Paris in that competition, your whole year's different, I imagine. All of a sudden, you know, you're kind of in that competition grind and I don't fully understand all the qualification uh, mechanics. Like I've talked to a couple people about this and it's still really confusing and they're confused and no one seems to know how it works. But um but yeah, I imagine it would have been a completely different year with a lot more continued focus on indoor climbing and competition readiness if you hadn't secured your ticket at the World Championships. Yeah, I mean, it would have definitely been different. Um, maybe not crazy different. Like, I, I always had the plan and I always had it scheduled to go to Flatanga in September, no matter what. It was just too important uh, to me. I waited like basically a, a full year. I, I knew Adam was going there in spring like a couple of times and it was always so hard to hold back and not go with him. Mm. Um, uh, and I really wanted to get back on the route. So I knew whatever happens at the at Bern, I'm going to go to Flatunger and um, maybe don't have like the perfect preparation for Laval. Um, but maybe I would have scheduled the, the trip a bit uh, less long. Um, and most importantly, I wouldn't have been able to just fully focus on it, how I was able to do with the ticket in my back. You know, it's just having that out of your head and not like thinking about it all the time just helps a lot. And you're like, really, you feel free and mm. you feel energized to focus on something else. So I think um, after a, it, it was a really big deal because I don't know if I would have had the right mindset and um, enough like focus in me for BIG if I wouldn't have had the ticket secured already. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm curious, how has your inspiration changed over the last handful of years of competition? You've been competing for so long, like over a decade at the at the highest level. Um, and it seems like I, I the question I have, like I, I couldn't tell or I can't tell if it's just because now you're on YouTube and you're sharing so much more of your rock climbing. Um, but it feels like you've actually your inspiration has shifted and it seems like you're a lot more inspired by you know, roots like BIG or DNA, um, some of these hardest things in the world that you've been pursuing and trying. Um, ha have things shifted for you? Are you kind of feeling drawn more towards outdoor rock climbing in the last few years? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think I've always been really drawn to outdoor climbing or rock climbing, and I've always done it quite a lot. But um, like, I've always done my trip to Spain every winter, basically, since I'm like 16, I, I went for like two or three weeks to Spain in the winter. Uh, it's more that I do a lot more of those trips, like over the last couple of years than I did back in the day when I just did a lot more competitions. It's just like doing the full bouldering season and the full lead season, and then also doing like five, two week trips. It's just not possible because mm. both seasons going from like April to November back then even so there was not really that much time to to do a lot of rock trips uh, I was just really focused on competi competitions back then and now over like the last few years already um I've started to focus more on like special or the most important competitions I would say like this year it would be burn and then I do a, a couple of competitions before burn to basically prepare myself for the world championship um but uh it's all about the world championship and then after the world championship I, I was basically done with the season um and just took the whole rest of the year to focus on outdoor climbing and i did the same with um yeah the year before the olympics or even or two years because of the pandemic um uh, and also now like the last year uh where i just pick 
a really important competition to me, try to focus on it, but then skip a lot of other World Cups. Uh, that's why I've never really done the lead overall anymore or also not the bouldering overall. Just pick a few comps and that means I have a lot more time for some really big projects outside. And mm. uh, yeah, this, how I'm doing it right now is is just perfect to me. And mm. I feel like it, if, my, if my body would be like would just not get older i could do this for another 20 years because it's so much fun <laughs> oh that's awesome to hear that's incredible do you do you feel like um taking time away from some of those competitions and, and focusing just on the important ones and focusing more on outdoor rock climbing like does that does that help um does it make it harder to compete at the highest level to spend more time on rock or does it help keep your body fresh and actually make it easier to compete at your best at the the highest level of competition like because it seems like you know as indoor climbing has progressed and changed and competition climbing has shifted um outdoor rock climbing and competitions it seems like they're getting further and further apart and um it seems like it's getting harder than ever to to do your best at both at the same time but i don't know maybe i'm completely wrong because because you're proof that you can do all three at the at the highest level um so, so yeah, do, does it feel, how does it feel in comparison to what you were doing before where you're just kind of in that competition grind year round? Mm, I mean, I would say it definitely feels like it's not worse. I would say it's, it's better for sure. Like I would say I'm, I'm, I'm getting stronger. I'm like, uh, on all those outdoor projects and like climbing really hard outside is definitely also where you learn a lot about yourself about your climbing I, I would say like i mean i've been doing also outdoor projects for like more than 10 years and i would say some of those routes have teach me way more than like a full year of training in the gym you know mm. um uh, like when you're trying uh oh Hmm. What's happening? There we go. I, I don't. I, did I like cut out? I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not sure either. You you froze on my end, but I, I'm not sure. Yeah, which, which you it froze was. on my end, and then I was like. <laughs> stopping because your video froze but mm. then i was like yeah okay i don't know you reconnected yeah sorry no, it seems no no worries it seems fine now so yeah you were saying you've learned more from some of those outdoor climbs than from a year of training and then i lost you you want to pick it up there yeah yeah so i think if you're like trying something really close to your limit outdoors and you're like really projecting it for let's say weeks or days and you try it over and over again it really teaches you a lot about um efficiency and climbing it very efficient right if you really want to get like as close as possible to your limit you you know you have to climb everything as perfect as possible to be able to climb that route and uh off you never try anything as much in the gym like no one wants to try a boulder in the gym for like two weeks or something, you know, you're just suddenly <laughs> going to set something else. But outdoors, you have the motivation to do it. You really want to finish that project. And um, it often, yeah, it teaches you a lot about what it means to climb efficient, efficiently and especially for yourself with your style and all that. Um, so, so there's that. And then obviously it also keeps me really motivated if I climb outside, but then also have the competitions. Um, like, don't get me wrong. I think as someone who has done well at comps and has done a lot of comps, I think you also have to love training inside um, in the gym. That's also something I definitely enjoy. And uh, I think they just really add up together really well. Mm. Like often you train really hard to do well at the competition and then it means you're like in a really good shape and after the comp you go outside and take all that shape and uh measure yourself on some of the hardest routes you know um uh, and 
back in the day when I did all the comps, it would also be more difficult to be in a great shape all the time because doing a lot of competitions, it definitely tires you out. So I would say even that, um, just focusing on single comps is easier. Um, but back in the day, also the overall World Cup was meant a lot. I felt like it was the most important thing. Mm. Um, uh, and you really wanted to win the overall World Cup. And for that, obviously, you had to do all the World Cups. I feel like over the last years, the overall World Cup really lost, like, I don't know, weight or no one really cares about it anymore. I mm. think that's actually something the IFSC really has to um, work on and try to make the World Cup interesting again. Because right now, everyone just cares about doing World Championships and qualifying for the Olympics. Um, and yeah, I think the World Cup is not as important anymore mm. to a lot of strong athletes. Yeah, that's interesting. That makes a lot of sense. Do you think that is mostly because of the Olympics and the emphasis on qualifying? As well, I think, I mean, obviously there's the problem that like this Olympics and also the past Olympics in Tokyo, the discipline that we're climbing at the Olympics is not even a discipline that we climb at the World Cup. So you don't have, you can't even take the World Cup as a qualification process because you have like, you need comps in the Olympic discipline. Um, so I think if we actually get all three disciplines um, uh, for the next Olympics in Los Angeles, then uh, that's already an improvement. So you can use the World Cup to qualify for the Olympics. But also uh, it's, it's um, marketing and everything. I feel like there could be just talked about it more, you know, mm. like, uh, I feel like right now, like, do you even know who won the overall, you know, you mm. kind of know who, you know, who got world champion, but I don't know. That's that, that, that would be a question for you. Do you know who won all the overalls? It's no, I like, don't. No one knows. <laughs> yeah. The IFSC is not really like, there's not really a talk mm. about it. You know, Interesting. Um, if you take the skiing world cup, that's like, uh, uh, skiing is pretty big in Austria, for example. Uh, the overall World Cup, it has like a trophy that everyone knows, like this crystal ball already like, you know, everyone thinks about the crystal ball when you talk about this overall, there will probably be like a lot of price money for it. Then everyone talks about it and it's all about that, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there's just a lot to be done. And then there's the next thing where uh, price money for the World Cups is is a real joke um, mm. right now. And that's also something that IFSC has to work on, I think, because that would that's also not like an attraction and it's not how climbers make money anymore. Yeah, that's really interesting. That makes sense. Um, this is a tangent, but <laughs> but I, you know, because you focused on becoming the overall champion for many years, um, you've also won more golds, IFSC golds than any other man competing, which is amazing. I'm just imagining, like, do you have a trophy room in your house? Like, where do you put all these things? I'm imagining like, uh, Bilbo in the Hobbit movie, you know, when he goes inside the mountain yeah. and he's just wading through gold. Do you have like a, a room with all of your trophies and medals and stuff? No, I actually don't know. I'm not really that kind of guy. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's, Where do they all go? Uh, I mean, Where do you... I'm really... Uh, I mean, I like some of the trophies I don't have anymore. I gave them away or whatever. <laughs> or um, uh, Like I, I saved some of the most important trophies or the ones that I think look cool, you know. I think I kept most of the medals or almost all of the medals. Um, and obviously the really important ones. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't know. It's, it doesn't mean that I'm not like proud of it or I really like, uh, obviously I'm, I'm really proud of what I achieved, but, uh, I don't really need the trophy to look at, to mm. remember. That sounds very healthy. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I wanted to go back to BIG and Alfane. Why those two of all the things that you could have focused on this year? What was it about those that route and that boulder that really spoke to you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think obviously there were also some coincidences why it was uh, those two. And now in hindsight, I'm I'm pretty I would call myself lucky that it was those two that uh, I was really projecting because they are both so amazing. Um, I mean, BIG was obviously like the story of Adam. Um, basically inviting me to try it with him in like uh, September 2022. Um, so he told me about this project in Flatunger. I really wanted to go to Flatunger or back to Flatunger anyways, because I haven't been for many years. And he told me there is this amazing project left um, straight through the cave that he really wants to try. And uh, if I would be keen to try it with him and uh, it just sounded really cool. 
um, and I really wanted to try with him together as well. It's always fun uh, trying with a strong friend, you know, like giving your giving each other beta. It just makes the whole process so much easier. It's uh, it's crazy than if you try something by yourself. Mm. Um, so that's how it all started, and um, we worked it for a full month back then, and both got relatively close, I would say. So. Um, it was unfinished business and it was clear that I had to return and try again because it's just a, a really amazing route. And um, uh, I'm, I'm that kind of guy that doesn't really get it out of his head if he hasn't like finished it, you know, especially if it felt possible. Mm. Um, and Althane, I mean, Althane was kind of like obvious to try for me. It's just uh, obviously it's the, the 9A boulder that's the closest to my place as well, to Innsbruck. It's like four and a half hour drive um, to Ticino from my house. So it's really not that bad. Um, and when I saw the video of the boulder for the first time, I knew I really wanted to try it. It just really seemed like my style and also um, a boulder that I just love trying because it's almost feels like a short route. You know, it's not about that one single move and you have to try one move for like two weeks over and over again, which can be kind of boring to me mm. um but it's more about connecting 10 hard moves together uh which is always something i enjoyed way more and also about uh efficiency or something like that like i talked before like in a lead route like trying to do every move as efficient as possible to be able to add them together um i i just really enjoy problems like that and uh yeah uh that's why uh once i tried Alphane, it was clear I really wanted to try it over and over again until I'm able to send it because it's just a really cool boulder. That's awesome. Yeah, it looks it looks incredible. And um that makes total sense. I'm I'm the same way with my own climbing. Like for the hardest boulders that I've done, doing something longer and piecing more moves together, it's so easy to stay motivated. You can see those little, you know, glimpses of progress exactly. along the way. Yeah. You're actually like doing some climbing instead of just chalking and brushing and staring at the wall a lot, you know. <laughs> staring at your yeah, skin exactly yeah that yeah. that's exactly it you have like you see progress you have different moves to work on um all those things and um yeah alphane also has the advantage of of being a boulder that's not really like crazy condition dependent not really tough on the skin and because you always basically you're always able to add a few moves together um every time you're there you feel like you have done a really you have had like a really great session you know mm -hmm. so uh it was even good um preparing for the bouldering world cups i even went there sometimes for two days and felt like i had a good training session and that wouldn't be the same on like some boulders where you try one move and you you try one move and then you wait again like 15 minutes or whatever try your skin try one move again um uh yeah, you're not going to be as exhausted and not as happy going back home after such a trip, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then I love that you, t you know, you mentioned trying BIG with Adam, Adam Andra for people listening in case that wasn't obvious. Um, I've noticed, again, I don't know if this is just because you're on YouTube now and you're doing more of these collaborations and sharing those with people, or maybe you've always done this where you team up with other really high level climbers. Because like you said, I imagine it's it's so much more fun and almost... And also um, so much more efficient to work on something with someone where you're both discovering the beta and talking about it versus just, you know, doing that alone. Um, but yeah, you've done a lot more collaborations with Adam Andra and Stefano uh, Gisolfi in the last few years. How has it impacted your climbing to spend time with those guys, to team up with them and try some of the hardest routes in the world with with these other really amazing climbers? Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't like, especially in the case of like, uh, trying uh, BIG with Adam, I wouldn't say YouTube had anything to do with it. Um, I mean, maybe in that term, like a little, like why it was also adding up even better was because he just, uh, changed to a sponsorship with Mammoth as well. And I was mm. also with Mammoth. So it was really easy to also, um, make the videos together. So I would say, uh, like we would have always loved to team up on BIG, even if we didn't have sponsors or there was no video or whatever, just because we're both like super psyched climbers and we know how much more fun it is and how much more easy it is if we try to route together. Um, uh, but especially like because we both are making videos now, um, it was a great advantage that we both had Mahmoud because then you're not really getting with different brands in your way, you know, mm. um, uh, I would say. Um 
And then, yeah, obviously you're doing like some collaborations for YouTube also, like some of the things with Stefano, maybe, okay, we're going to do this thing for YouTube. But uh, all those things already happened like way before we were all on YouTube. You know, I've known Adam and also Stefano for so many years and I've also climbed with them so much uh, on all the competitions. Um, uh, You guys only see us on on the wall once you're like... uh, out there climbing in front of the crowd but there's so much more happening in the back like we're warming up together we're talking about the route about all the projects <laughs> um that we have uh, have outside on the rocks um in iso and uh yeah it, it was just um some good opportunities to climb with them again and um it's definitely something that has always been really important to me i've i've grown up already as a climber who um climbs in a team who's always training with these with his buddies you know uh so i'm like that kind of person that if i have to train alone those are like by far the worst sessions and i hate it like Mm. i really need people around me and i need um friends to train with because that's what makes me most psyched and also i feel like um, i'm learning the most and i mean especially adam is definitely one of the climbers i learned the most from over the years i mean he has beat me multiple times in competition and obviously then it's the guy that you're looking up to you're trying to watch his videos and everything and try to analyze what he does differently um than you and i think uh i I definitely try to copy some of the things that he does best i love that i was gonna ask you about that and it's so cool to hear that at your level i mean you know you're trying big with him and you ultimately do it first that you're still hungry and you're still willing to explore what he's doing and analyze it and learn from him. Um, What are some of the things that you've learned from climbing with Adam and or Stefano and anyone else? Like what, what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned from climbing with, with other high level climbers? We can talk about Adam specifically if, you know, it sounds like he's someone you spend a lot of time analyzing. Obviously there's many climbers and there's, uh, there's always like, you know, everyone has strengths and weaknesses. I mean, Adam has some things he does amazing. And then there's other things where there's someone else that excels at it. And you obviously always, um, yeah, want to look at the people that are best at it anything like um uh, uh there's outdoor climbing and there there's competitions like i don't know there's like some of the japanese climbers that are just excel at some things like if you take tomo and arasaki on like dynamic boulders i don't think there's anyone that can challenge him and uh obviously you then if you're like thinking about dynamic boulders you try to look at him and watch videos and what he does uh, but i would say yeah adam is obviously the climber that i have done the most competitions with over like the last uh yeah like <laughs> almost 20 years or like uh, 15 years um uh, and um he has always been a climber that really inspired me and i would say um the biggest difference in our climbing styles were especially back in the day that he would climb way faster than me and also uh way riskier like he would basically whenever like it doesn't matter if it was qualification semi-final or final at a comp he would it looked like he would go all in Mm. um that meant he was climbing very efficiently but also pretty risky and maybe sometimes he would mess up and maybe not even make finals i mean obviously that was really rare but he could be like eighth in finals could he because he would slip or whatever you know and i would be more of the super safe climber like i would almost always um uh, reach the podium or basically always make finals but if i'm against adam in finals and he doesn't make a mistake he just climbs more efficient than me because he's not climbing as safe and i basically have no chance beating him Mm. so that was always something i was like mad about my style and i really like if you could flip the switch and say "Ah, okay just in finals i'm gonna climb like adam um probably i would have done that but that's not really easy it's like kind of your climbing style right Mm. so i think that's something i really try to learn from him like climb faster climb with more risk and just like try to go all in more and it's also something that especially this year or no yeah it's like ninth of January, it's still hard because we're in the next year, but like 2023, <laughs> I think I did it really well. Mm. Um, just climbing way faster, way more efficient without any fear. And that's something I've always looked up to Adam and tried to learn from him. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's 
That, that's really interesting. And I'm going to fill in a little context for people listening. I think most people understand this, but when you say risk, you're not talking about physical risk. You're talking about you, you know, moving with more momentum and um, saving energy, but at the cost of you have a higher likelihood of slipping or not hitting the next hold just right or whatever. And it sounds like you climb slower exactly, yeah. in more control and kind of overpower things a little bit more. So yeah, that makes a lot exactly. of sense. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he, I mean, he's known for that, you know, in, in his indoor, outdoor climbing. H- have you noticed, th- I mean, that's really interesting. One thing that's really different about competitions versus outdoor climbing um, is that outdoor climbing, you always get to try the route again. So have you noticed that it's been more helpful to shift towards that riskier style for outdoor projects because you get to try again if you slip off? Of course. I mean, that's also why, like, once I've, projected way more i think it was also easier for me to understand the style from adam for example Mm. because if you're like projecting a lot of roots you automatically get this kind of style like you have everything really automated like um and so you can really power through it or climb really really fast sometimes um doing it on an on-site in a comp route is obviously way different but trying to do it and being uh it makes you pretty efficient if you're able to do it. So it makes sense. But yeah, outdoors, obviously I'm trying to do the same thing. Um, I think you still have to be like, sometimes it's not even the best concept. I think like it's climbing faster doesn't always mean uh, climbing more efficient. I think you have to find your way because you can also overpower by climbing too fast. Um, Mm. But if you're like, uh, watching videos of BIG, for example, I think there are sections where we definitely climb quite fast just because we know it so well and uh, really like, you know, you don't have to spend a single thought about where you have to place your foot or whatever. So you can climb really fast and save power by that. Mm-hmm. It sounds like, yeah, it's, it sounds like um, there was so much learning in the complexity of that route in particular. It's so long. It's so overhung for so long. And so, you know, Adam in your video was talking about how um, you're in these knee bar rests, but you really have to do this kind of analysis of like, how long should I stay here? Because I'm kind of recovering my forearms, but my legs are getting tired and I'm going to need my legs for, you know, 50 more meters or whatever. Um, Can you describe the route a little bit and and some of those complexities and um, some of your process on it? Because, yeah, I think this is the route you've tried longer than anything else correct yeah that's correct yeah yeah Yeah, sure um yeah i mean so first of all let's start how amazing the route is because that's the best part right i mean um in general flatanger is just an amazing place uh it's in norway it's with all the fjords and the sea around it it's just uh, a fantastic place, like very relaxing, not a lot of streets, not a lot of houses. Uh, you kind of feel like, yeah, you're in the middle of nature and you're mm. just like enjoying yourself. And then you have this amazing granite uh, granite um, uh, cave. Uh, when, yeah, when you see it from afar, you're like, that's just, it's unbelievable. <laughs> like uh, someone just really thought about us climbers putting it there. You know, it's just uh, <laughs> yeah. so perfect. It's it's amazing. And the rock quality in this cave is just the best. Um, like there is no Sika. Everything is natural. You have like amazing rock shapes, um, really nice on the skin as well. And uh, just really steep. That means you still, even though it's granite, you still are able to get, find like really, really hard roots. And then there is this route just going straight through the cave, basically. Or it's it's a little on the left, but it goes like all the way through the cave and stops once you're like out of the overhang. And uh, yeah, that's that's BIG. And uh, you start with like an easy 7A and then you get into the hard part. I mean, I don't know how much I should explain because I can talk like a full hour about this route. <laughs> but um <laughs> Um, I mean, yeah, the most, I would say the diff, like the most difficult section of the route is kind of like halfway up. You have done a 8C route up to that point. Um, then you have a knee bar rest. You have like a dihedral rest before where you're like kind of in a split. Then you have a knee bar or two knee bar rests. And then you have like these 15 meters, um, of just very powerful climbing with the crux being like the last moves of those um, 15 meters. And I would say only these 15 meters are at least like hard 9B. 
Um, and after that, you have like the victory lap on like an 8A plus, mm. uh, like another 25 meters or something where wow. you're not supposed to fall anymore. Um, <laughs> but yeah, especially the 15 hard meters are just, yeah, some of the coolest moves that I've done, like perfect holds. And it's just, yeah, definitely one of the best routes out there. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, I can't wait for more people to try and see it because it's just such a good route. Um, and yeah, I think the hard part about the route is not only the difficulty of the moves um, or like the endurance and all that, but also what you said, like um, there's so many rests where you don't really like a, I've never tried a route before that's so much on your full body, you know? Usually it's all mostly about your arms, but uh, I've had that one day where I gave B.I.G. a try and I realized I was kind of tired in my legs that day mm. and I had no chance. Like, wow. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know, because uh, every knee bar, you need to be kind of fresh in your legs as well. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to stay as long. You're not going to be able to relax as much. And all of a sudden you're not as fresh on the heart sections and it's very hard mentally as well, especially with no hands. Like I would say I've always been a climber that doesn't really enjoy no hand rests that much. Like I would always choose a route that doesn't have a single no hand rest because it's mentally also much easier. Mm. Like you don't, you don't get thrown out of your flow. Um, so like once you're like in your flow, but then there's a no hand rest and then all of a sudden you need to decide like, how long should I stay here? Like, uh, do I feel ready? Also, all of those no hand rests that BIG has, they're not like you're sitting like it. I'm sitting in this chair right now, you know, <laughs> they're still a little tiring mm -hmm. either for your legs or for something. Um, so you kind of have to decide and weigh in, should I keep going? Should I like spend a little more time? And that also can really freak you out in your head. Like, ah, oh, you even get to touch your forearm, like, oh, damn, I think it's a bit harder than last time or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think mentally, it's also a very hard route, just staying focused and doing all those decisions. Um, but that's also what made it really interesting and something you could really learn and improve from. How long is the route overall? Like, I don't even know. In in meters, it's something like like. 50, 60 meters and moves. I think it's wow. about like 120 moves. <laughs> yeah. Because you're kind of like traversing at the start and then you go like straight up. Yeah. 50 or 60 meters. So how how did that work logistically? You know, like we've all watched Adam on some of these other cave routes and flatting or um, like silence and, um, you know, change and these other things. And a number of times he's like climbed with two ropes and like dropped one of the ropes or transitioned ropes or whatever. Um, how did it work logistically? Are you, are you climbing this whole thing on one rope? And I remember you, you know, you clipped the chains and you had to unclip the chains to take a huge fall to be able to make it back to the ground. So I'm, I'm curious about that. And also just like, what does that feel like? Like, what does that feel like to pull 50 meters of rope up that steep of an overhang? Um, you know, like how does it feel by the time you get to the top of that thing? Um, yeah, it was actually with all those things, it was not as bad as, um, I thought. I mean, uh, it's also something I kind of learned from Adam. Like he was the first guy that, uh, put on, put on all the draws and then also like kind of teach me what is the best way to try the route. And, uh, the best and easiest way was, so you kind of start in like a seven, a plus, and it's almost like a, it's kind of like a little traverse, like you go upwards, but you also traverse in the beginning and then you leave the 7A plus like a few meters before the chain and go straight up. So this would be the worst rope drag. And mm -hmm. that's why we always climb with two ropes, uh, two ropes up to that point and then untie one rope there because you have like a really good rest where you can even do like a little no hand. And then from there, go with the other rope. And from there, all the way to the top, which is probably like 50, 50 meters or something, you can all go with one rope. Um, you just have to skip quite a few clips obviously and also um we have like a lot of draws where we put like more than one draw so they're way longer mm -hmm. so i think um for the whole route it, i took like uh almost 40 draws wow um by like extending and everything wow <laughs> um <laughs> yeah so yeah if you have enough draws uh it's it's okay and then in the end yes you do have rope drag but not crazy actually mm. i'm gonna mix in some listener uh some listener questions here i got a great one 
Um, what was going through your head? This is from Riley. What was going through your head when that hold broke on BIG? Yeah, I mean, I have to say, it went so fast, like not much was going through my head, but obviously it was just uh, a crazy moment. Um, and I really tried to stay focused right when it happened, like, um, because I was lucky in that moment, I was like, ah, whatever, just keep going, you know, and uh, just once I came down, I actually had time to think about it. And obviously, my friends were also, damn, what the hell? What happened there? Like, the hole broke. And I was, like, joking around back then and telling them, yeah, like, I think if I would have fallen there, that, that would have ended my career, you know? like Because uh, I think it would have been just so crazy devastating. It's not something you can come back from. Like, obviously, choking, but still. Um, uh, yeah, it, it was a crazy moment. But now, in the end, it's actually, like, a cool story to tell. So... <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah, that's amazing. So for people that didn't see that on the live stream, I think you were hanging on from one hand, right? Like you were like chalking up or just hanging on from one hand. Yeah, I was like, so it was already in the 8A part on my scent go. Um, so it was like through the know, crux like and you're sending. 10 meters uh, away from the top, yeah. basically guaranteed to scent because it's not that hard anymore. Um, resting and then a part of the hold that I had with my right hand broke. But I was like still, I think with my pinky and my ring finger, I was still inside of the jug, like the back end of the jug. So those two fingers still held me on, basically. <laughs> so yeah, it was pretty lucky. <laughs> yeah. Did it change? Did it change the experience or add stress to the experience to be live streaming it like that? I thought that was, it was really fun. It was really fun to be able to follow along with that. But I imagine like, man, that's even more pressure than you're al already experiencing. What was that like for you? Yeah, actually, it was not um, that bad, I, I would say. Uh, like, I mean, obviously, it was there were a few things that were making it a little different um, that I had to get used to, but it was not a big deal. I would say, like, the biggest thing was actually just um, having a schedule when I would do my try. Like, usually, when you're rock climbing, you're like, whenever you feel ready or mm. whenever your friend is done, you're just going to go and do your try, right? Um, uh, but because I had the live stream i tried to like at least schedule it around like 30 minutes so people can tune in uh so i would say that was actually kind of weird at first mm, like saying yeah. okay guys i'm gonna do my go at 12 o'clock and then all of a sudden i tried to be ready like in a competition tried to be ready at 12 o'clock um so that was <laughs> a bit weird at first to do that on a rock climb um and then i remember like especially on my first try i remember maybe overpowering a little bit on the bottom section, like the 8C, the, the very first part. There's like, just after leaving the 7A, you have like one um, boulder problem that's like a little uncomfortable with like a weird heel hook. And I remember just um, the day before uh, I started live streaming, I fell there for the first time, like pretty randomly. So all of a sudden I was pretty scared I would fall there because um, all I wanted to do is at least like show the people that I'm, doing pretty well on the route and right. like want to show how cool the route is and yeah. how well I'm doing um, and just want to show them a good try, you know? Um, so I remember kind of like overpowering over the first part and being a little nervous there. But then especially once I'm like in the crux section, I don't really remember ever thinking about the live stream because I'm so yeah. focused and um, there's no thoughts in my head anyways. So um, it didn't really have an influence on me. And especially when once I came down and after the first live streams realized um, how the people enjoyed following this process and how everyone cheered uh, for me, it was just really fun to see. And I think it gave me even more motivation. And it seemed like people didn't really care if I would do it or not. They were just psyched to be uh, part of the process, you know, and just seeing how how it is to to try something that hard. So that was really fun. That's awesome. Yeah, it was fun to revisit that. I, you know, I watched part of it yesterday on YouTube again, and you can see all the comments coming in, you know, when you're watching the replay. Yeah. And uh, you send the thing, and then, like, there's Adam Andre. He's like, congrats, man. You know, it's like even he's tuning in and watching, yeah. which, is, which is so cool. Do you think you'll do that? more like will, will you do live streams in the future was it was it a good experience overall it was definitely a really good experience i mean we were really like trying it out right like at first we didn't even know how well it will work with like picture and cameras and all that um and also we didn't know like 
how the people would like it, how many would tune in, all those things. Um, but I think it was an overall like great, great success. And uh, I really enjoyed doing it as well. So it's definitely something I would like to do again in the future. But uh, the, you also have to say that this route and the area, it was all like pretty perfect to do the live stream like first of all you need like a few parameters um to be fulfilled like um having good internet connection for example which is kind of weird that you have good internet connection in that cave but you mm. do for some reason um then you are also it's pretty easy to film the route from like different angles um like you already have because the ground is coming up with the cave you can set up a camera where you can already see the full route basically but then have like a few other um uh camera angles to to see something else so that was pretty good for the route and then also in general just having such a hard and long route where i'm only doing one try a day yeah um you can really schedule it because there's just one try a day and then you're also on the wall for a while so it's basically everyone knows yeah, okay i can like watch the 10 minutes of Jacob's try that today and then I'll be done with it. You know, I think for example, live streaming a boulder problem is way harder to make it interesting because sometimes like two hours is not really anything is happening. You know, mm. there, you know, there's this one try and that's it. And then next day there's another try maybe. Uh, so I think the route fit everything quite well to, to have a good live stream um but i'm sure there will be another possibility where hopefully it's just as great yeah what what was it like to try a route where you could only try it one try per day have you done that before or is this a unique case yeah that was a unique case i've never had that before i mean also it's um on the first trip i usually always did two tries and it was more like, um, yeah, seeing Adam doing only one, um, which maybe influenced me a bit, but also then realizing after doing it more that usually I only have a second one if my first one was not really good. Mm. Like uh, if my first one would really suck, then I would still have a second one. Um, but since most of my tries were pretty good that last trip, uh, I never felt like I had enough gas in the tank to do another like really good one. Wow. Well, so what was your what was your schedule like? Are you giving one try every day or still taking rest days? Are you I, I you know, there's that great footage of that um that training barn in Flat Hanger with the with the spray wall yeah. and stuff. Are you training at all while you're trying this thing? What does your overall schedule look like? Um yeah, I think overall I changed my strategy a little bit compared to the year before where we very often warmed up in the barn and then went up. I think this year I will I warmed up way more up at the crack um, uh, because I felt like warming up at the barn was pretty difficult um, to not be like if I would warm up at the barn, there was a high chance I would do too much. And then again, like not be as fresh as Mm. I wanted to be for the try. So I felt like it was almost easier just going up. And also there was like so many days where I had to go up the route a little bit and check if it was more wet or if I had to dry up something. Um, uh, so because I had to do that anyways, I felt like that was the best warm up to do. Um, and yeah, I mean, I definitely did rest days. So I usually did two days on one day off. And then once I think I did like one day on one day off one day on. Um, but yeah, most of the time, two days on one day, one day off. Gotcha. Yeah. It's- and um how, like whenever I would do the try, it all depended. Like obviously having the re- like when you do rest days, when you do climbing days, and also when you do your tries, it all depends dependent on uh, the weather and the conditions. Um, this trip, I was really lucky. Like there was almost no rest day that we were forced to do. I think there was only one. Um, usually, it always rained on our rest days randomly. <laughs> like I don't know just really lucky Mm. um and then the day i sent the route actually was one of the days where i thought like okay probably we can't climb today but then it was actually okay Mm. uh, because it was raining a lot but then the right wind came and that changed everything um uh, and yeah same with when you're doing your tries it all depended on the sun like when there would be days with sun you just have to be early enough because basically from i think it was um like two o'clock the sun would hit the wall or would hit big and then the day is over basically Mm. you can't try the route anymore 
Gotcha. Because it would leave like very late and the rock would stay warm for too long. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I'm going to throw in one more listener question here about flat tanger. This is from, I don't know how to pronounce this person's name. I think it's Anjuice. What are the logistics for, or what are the logistics like traveling to flat tanger? Um, How many people do you travel with? Where do you stay? Is this a good destination for a normal climber? Normals in in quotes there. Um, but yeah, what is it like to visit there? Um, yeah, I mean, it really depends what what you like. But I mean, it's definitely like nowadays it got much better to also find places. So first of all, there is a big camping. So if you enjoy camping, you can always camp there. Um, I'm more of the apartment guy, but nowadays you can also pretty easily find like a, a, an apartment there and um i was with uh two other climbers this time and um so two friends uh one from slovenia doman skofic and one from austria Georg Palma. they were both also climbers and then i brought a, a film crew with me in that case it was uh three guys um so then we were quite a few people in one apartment but it was it was all good and yeah, the other logistics are to get to Flatanger, Flatanger, it's not like the easiest destination, I would say. It kind of depends where, where you're from or what's your closest airport. But obviously, like driving there is a really long way, but people do it. Um, like Stefan Ogisolfi, for example, he drove there already mm. when he would stay like for two months or longer. Um, but it's like, I think, a 30 hour drive from Italy wow. or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. Like, Americans are more used to it than Europeans. So, we never really drive that long, I feel like. Yeah. Um, uh, also, on our streets, it's a lot more annoying. Um, uh, so, <laughs> uh, and yeah, taking a flight, you usually have to, like, yeah, I fly from Munich to Amsterdam and then to Trondheim, or you fly somehow to Oslo and then to Trondheim. And then you get a rental car and drive like, uh, three and a half hours to Flatanger. So it's not the easiest, I would say, but it's still pretty manageable. And I think it's definitely a place and an area that's that's really cool for anyone. Um, I mean, obviously, if you have like a higher level, I think it's even more interesting. But I've seen also a lot of people that might on, like might not climb harder than like 7A or something and have a lot of fun there or even like 6B. Mm. Uh, Cause more like outside of the cave on the left side, there's a lot of routes. That's awesome. Yeah, that it seems like there's there's plenty of climbing for every ability level there, all the way up to the hardest route in the world, <laughs> which is which is amazing. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I was curious. I want to ask you about the best hard routes in the world. You know, you've you've done Big now. You've tried DNA. Presumably, you've tried some of the other one. Oh, I mean, Silence is the only other proposed nine C. Um, but you know, lumping in like the the nine uh, B pluses that you've tried, like is Big one of the best routes in the world? Do you have an opinion on like what the best hard route in in the world is? You know, because as things get harder, it's really rare that they're also like really fun. You know, like that's something that's so amazing about this this Big route in Flattinger is it's so yeah, long true, and yeah. steep. You can actually have reasonable holds instead of just grabbing, you know, nasty little, like watching a Excalibur, for instance, watching Will Bosey or Stefano trying Excalibur. It looks amazing, but it also looks nasty. Like it doesn't look like the most fun bit of climbing because um, it's so, so short and punchy and compact. But um, but yeah, do you have an opinion on that? Like, do you have a favorite or, or a route that you think is the I best mean- hard route in the world? Yeah, I mean, obviously, that's. I think it's very subjective, of course. Uh, like, like you said, like something sharp or I don't know, pockets or whatever. Uh, like some people really like and other people don't like as much. But I mean, uh, and then I think for me, I would definitely say Big is one of the or maybe the best like super hard route in the world. It's just, um, yeah, an amazing route with amazing holds. And I think what plays a big role for me at least is also how natural it is. And it's a fully natural route. I think it's just very hard to find these really hard routes that are really completely natural, you know? And I think Flatanger is almost an exception to that where you have these super hard routes that are, um, yeah, basically have no Sika on it. Maybe there's like one hold that's a little fixed, but there's for sure no artificial um hold on it so i think mm-hmm. that's also what makes silence amazing but um silence is just a lot more weird and a lot more different of a route than anything else like uh there there's no route that 
is similar to silence, which you could say is makes it also amazing, you know. Um, but I wouldn't say it's as fun to climb on. Um, like especially if you try and try it again, because you mostly spend all your time on these three meters, because that's what it's all about. Like this this boulder problem basically. Um, and BIG is a lot more about a lot more moves. So uh for me it was definitely way more enjoyable to try BIG, and I think it is for the mo for most people. Um, so I would say, yeah. BIG is definitely way up there as one of the best routes. Uh, I've tried DNA, and DNA is also very amazing, I think. Um, uh, I think why I would rate BIG higher is also, it's just because it's even more natural and has like really no Sika at all. But mm. um, if you don't mind like a little Sika, you know, uh, DNA is still like such a good route as well. Mm. Well, um, are you going to go back yeah, for that one? If you take like more 90 pluses, I don't know. Like, uh, But yeah, BIG is definitely up there, and I would say first place <laughs> not that you're biased or anything no well, I, I love that say dna first place so you know <laughs> yeah totally totally are you going to go back and try dna again definitely yeah yeah Very it's cool. one of the big uh, goals for this year i really hope there will be time in in fall after the olympics go back and try dna because yeah it's definitely a really cool route to try and uh, i think adam is psyched too so nice we might team up again Hell yeah. I'm hoping so. We are all hoping so. Uh, this is a question from Emily. What does BIG stand for? Is Yeah, what does it stand for? Um, I mean, I, it depends. Uh, you can, I mean, obviously it stands for big, but also it, it can stand for bullet in the gut, like whatever you want, you know? <laughs> um, I mean, that would be from Notorious BIG, or is it like... Um, uh, Wait, what was it? Another business instead of game? Yeah, that's it. Business instead of game? Business instead of game. Okay, so it's Notorious B.I.G. Yeah. And, and rap no, lyrics. No, I mean, but it's not really like... Uh, I didn't really put the letters um, because it would stand for something. It was more like... Obviously, uh, when whenever I was talking about the route, it was... Um, it was project big, right? Like for so long, when I talked to Adam or with someone else, we were always talking about project big. So even once I had the name for the route, I would often name it project big because it was just really in my mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's also what Adam gave the, like the name that Adam gave the route and he bolted it. And uh, I think I would also, I would have never sent the route without the help of Adam. Um, so I really wanted to keep the spirit of big, which also um, like, yeah, the root is um, in the name kind of um, at the same time, I didn't want to call it big cause I think that's lame. Um, so I just like found my way with like BIG and um, also because, yeah, I like, I like the, 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 the music of rap or hip hop and notorious BIG has some good tracks. So I felt like that's a, that fits, fits quite well. <laughs> nice. Yeah. The periods do make it cooler somehow, don't they? <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Okay. Um, so I, I have a question that's kind of about BIG and about Alphane. You know, because you had tried, I, I believe you tried both of them. You tried Alphane well before you ended up going back and doing it, correct? Like you've had multiple seasons on it? Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So BIG, you tried it with Adam for like a month and then you have to wait a whole year till the next fall, till this most recent fall. Um, what were you thinking about as far as your preparedness and what you would need to go back for, for that route? You have a whole year to think about it, you know? Um, are there specific things that you know that you need to work on and, and ways in which you need to level up to have a good shot at doing it when you go back? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of things that you're like thinking about what you can do better or uh, things that you need to work on compared to last time. I mean, then there's even logistics like bringing knee pads and bringing different kind of knee pads than the last time because I felt like they could work better. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, in general, I mean, I was also just ready to go there and then work from there. Um, and I think, like I said before, I mean, it was pretty close to burn going there. So I knew my shape was great. I knew 
Um, I had so much confidence and that really helped a lot. And at the end of the day, I also knew that like from the year before, it's going to be a lot about conditions. Um, this route is really unforgiving when it comes down to conditions. Like if you're unlucky, you're not going to be able to try it for like weeks, basically. Um, uh, but there was definitely a few things that I knew had to work like a little better um, if I would have, if I want a chance to send the route. And um, I also knew that starting over again will be really good just trying to refine some beta you know like the year before we were already doing tries we were getting close so you kind of don't want to waste to go and just like work mm. sections again and like refine beta and everything because you're like doing tries so it felt good and i i was ready to just give it some time like spend a few days just trying like get all the beta dialed again, but also try to find like some tiny things that maybe I can refine. And I think that was also a big key to be able to send because I found those two or three little mm. differences that made a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. You're not like, um, you're not like referring back to your old beta and memorizing everything you're actually like wanting to go into it with fresh eyes and, and kind of explore and, and see things a little differently exactly yeah That's and cool. i mean obviously especially for like certain sections right there was like i would say for me there were two like there is the big crux section which is the actual crux to send the root um but i always really loved that boulder problem still i felt like i had to yeah refine it maybe a little bit even more and get it just as dialed again as the year before because that's what it all comes down to if you want to send the route but then there was another little crux for me which um i think was also kind of like the difference between adam and myself the year before like he would always cruise for that through that first little crux which is right after the batman hang like it's the start of the hard part basically um uh, and i think he always cruised through that part but uh so I, he would always make it to the crux section and I would sometimes fall in that first crux because I would really struggle on the knee bar. And I knew it would really help me to be better on that first crux mm. somehow and also make it more consistently to the, to the actual crux because I felt like I was actually better on the actual crux than Adam. So if I would get there more times, I would have like a really good shot of sending the route. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's that's great. Um, what, were, what were like, one you know, one or two of those specific things that you changed. I'm I'm just curious, really zooming in here on the yeah, details. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean that's it's very detailed. Like it's you kind of need to know the root home or like you really need to know have it in your head kind of. But like um so when you're I don't know if you know like the last there's like a last knee bar rest before the crux, but I didn't do it, but Adam does it you know, where he like releases the hands quickly and then catches himself again. Like I don't even, and you, you do the the clip where I took the really big fall once. Um, so from there you do the really big move to the sloper and then you get a toe hook in, you have your left foot out, you match, and then you get into the position with your hands to do the big move, but you still have your toe hook in. So um, we always tried putting our left foot already on the foothold, which we would use for the big move and then get our right foot out and just bump it on the wall and keep the left foot. Um, and that would require like a lot of body tension to keep the left foot while putting out the toe hook. Um, and sometimes the foot would slip and we have to like come back in and catch it again. And in the best case scenario, we would just get it out and then get ready to do the big move. And I realized it was much easier for me to just cut feet on purpose Mm. swing back in and immediately catch the foothold because it would actually take less power for me to s take the swing than actually like dragging the foot out because it would wow. take so much tension and also by doing that swing i would get the foothold even better because i'm getting it with a swing basically mm. so i think that was actually a big thing like finding that out like i remember the year before i was also trying it once i was like nah i think taking the swing is like it's taking too much power it was also risky because there was also a try i had um 
where you take the swing and you don't hit the foothold immediately and you take another swing mm. and basically the go is dead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you took like you just did like 15 minutes of climbing for nothing because oh. you took that stupid swing, you know? <laughs> but it's a risk. I felt like it, it was worth taking. And after some time doing it more and more, I learned it so well that I would basically always get the perfect swing and catch the foothold perfectly. Wow. And it would save me like quite a bit of power for the big move. Yeah. Man, it seems like you have exceptionally good muscle memory for dynamic moves. Like I was I wasn't sure if we would talk about this or not, but one thing I noticed from your deep water solo video with Espontis is um and, and you know, I, I'm sorry for people that were losing here that haven't watched all these things. I know it's gonna be a little bit uh confusing, but Espontis is this famous channel. They're gonna tune in. Oh yeah, go follow go follow him and, and <laughs> his YouTube channel and watch all these things. There we go. Um S. Pontus, famous Chris Sharma arch deep water solo with the dyno, right? Like we've hopefully all seen that. Um, and you guys were trying it with with an easier start so that you could get to the dyno over and over and over again and try the dyno. And then you you do the whole route that way from the easier start. And then you immediately send the actual route next try. And it's like, you know, you've tried 30 times and finally stuck the dyno once and then you do it again from the harder start. I was just like... How the fuck did you do that? That's amazing. Um, has that always been a superpower of yours? Like, do you feel like you have a really good muscle memory for dynamic movement? Is that something you specifically have worked on or is that just kind of come natural to you? I mean, in that case, I was definitely surprised myself that I would do it like right, a, right away again and not just like the next try, but the day, the try like two hours later. Um, that was definitely really amazing. Um, but yeah, I do think it's it's one of my strengths, not necessarily just with like dynamic moves, but usually with like, um, if I've learned moves, it's um, I'm pretty good at connecting them at some point. Like I know that some of my friends always say that this is like kind of like a, a big strength of mine that once I'm like working out a boulder and let's say it's not crazy power endurance or something, like, I don't know, once I did every single move in Alphane, I was far from sending it because it's so close to my limit. But on other things, like if, if the move is not crazy on my limit and I kind of like learned it or it's more tricky, I'm usually very good at connecting it quite fast. Mm. And yeah, I mean... It's not something I worked specifically on. I think it's just coming with like climbing a lot, a lot. And um, obviously I think I've, yeah, I've always tried to be a very like overall climber, um, like trying to not have any weaknesses and just be good at everything. And when there is like, uh, when I'm trying a boulder with friends, for example, and there is like, I have the the easiest beta for myself to do the boulder, but then I see someone else doing a completely different beta. And although I've already sent the boulder, I'm really interested in like trying the different beta because all of a sudden you're basically doing a different move. And uh, if I've always been like that, like just really mm -hmm. curious and trying to learn as much as I can. That's and cool. I think that also helps with just like, yeah, learning a lot of movements. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That's interesting. Um, going back to Alphane, so you had a similar process where you tried it for a while and then had a big you know, block of time away from it and then came back to it. And I was reading your Instagram post about, I think it was in your, you know, your top five moments of 2023 where you talked about that process a little bit more. Um, or maybe it was uh, just... Alphane is actually coming up on the next post. Oh, okay. I, I guess it was just when <laughs> you sent it. I think it was it. just after like, because I just did it, yeah. I okay. was talking about it a bit more. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. getting gonna put some more insights on that post nice i'm excited to read that of, yeah of some work i have to do <laughs> but yeah you said that you you tried it and you were surprised at how hard the first part of the boulder was the first few moves and you realized you had to work on your finger strength before you came back and i just wanted to know how you did that like how did you work on your finger strength for alphane given that you already have some of the strongest fingers in the world. What did that look like to to try to level up your finger strength for Alphane? Yeah, I mean, I think it was not as much um, about like training my fingers, but more like waking up my fingers, I feel like. Um, like I do think I have very strong fingers, but still if you were not really crimping a lot for like half a year almost, um, 
you have to get used to it again and like kind of remind your fingers that you're they're actually strong you know mm. and that's what i really felt like i had to do because like um on competitions especially bouldering world cups nowadays you basically never crimp anymore unfortunately um <laughs> uh, and uh, in flat hunger you also don't crimp as much um and then once yeah once i tried to get ready for a fame i felt like the crazy thing was actually that um it was not just the strength, but I, at the beginning, I always like the first two moves. I had to crimp so hard that my fingers would almost like start hurting um, just from crimping so hard. And after doing two moves, I would kind of want to go down because it's like mm. really, really um, painful. Um, and I felt like I really had to get used to crimping hard again. And what I did was just spend a lot of time on the wooden board on our gym where we have like pinches slopers but also a lot of crimps and just try to do a lot of boulders on it and i think it went really well and uh once i came back uh, i actually really felt much better on the first moves but i wouldn't say it was all the finger strength it was also a lot about watching videos and analyzing what i'm doing mm. differently because alfane is such a it was such an interesting boulder it's it's very powerful. You need to be very strong. It's a lot about body tension, finger power, everything. But overall, it's also amazingly technical, like mm. very, very technical. And you don't think so. If you look at the boulder and you see people trying it, you would think, ah, okay, it's basically 90% power, but there is so much small technical things um, that make it a challenge and like weird things that you need to learn, uh, which I only realized yeah, a couple of months ago, I feel like. And then watching Lorenzi's video, Simon Lorenzi, and then watching all the other videos, trying to make some videos of myself, especially on the start, comparing them, seeing the different body positioning, seeing how their left knee is somewhere else where my knee was. Mm. All those things mattered a lot. Um, and I also enjoy those things a lot, just <laughs> like watching videos, analyzing, and then when it actually works out, it's it's the best feeling. Yeah. You, try, you, you feel so smart. <laughs> That's cool. That's really cool. That makes sense. It seems like that fits your personality. I, I, I read somewhere that if you hadn't become a professional climber, you'd be like a mathematician or, or something like that. And I know you love chess as well. So that all, that all really fits. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I, I definitely like, like thinking like that. Yeah. Mm. Like analyzing. That's also one thing I really liked about speed training, mm. uh, like back in the day for Tokyo, you know, um, because it's easy to like, you can watch from all the best speed climbers videos and you're doing the exact same thing basically mm. on the same route. Uh, so it's, it's very analytical and I really enjoyed that about the discipline, but yeah, unfortunately I, I wasn't as good as it at it. So I couldn't enjoy it as much as like leader bowler, obviously. <laughs> Are you, do you miss it? Do you miss speed at all? No, I would say so. No, I mean, I <laughs> no think one it's, does. Like I said, it was definitely like I actually kind of enjoyed um, training it. It was it was fun. Um, it was just too much. Like yeah, especially yeah. for I feel like for my body, like training, bouldering lead. Um, I I trained it basically just as much as before because I wanted to get better in bouldering and lead, mm -hmm. and then just added speed climbing on top of it, and I felt like. Uh, I would have got like I got like inflammation after inflammation basically and mm. had to like really care for my body because it was too much. So I really, yeah, especially in that regard, I really don't miss it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are some of the key things that you do to help with recovery? Aside um, from just rest, I mean, I go to, obviously. Yeah. 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 I mean, obviously, <laughs> um, uh, I go to a physiotherapist like once a week and um, I also do like, one or two sessions of like mobility training um which is again training um but i always feel like it also really helps me recovering of like after a climbing session uh, like usually on one of my climbing rest days i go to the gym and i have like my own coach at the olympic center and we work on like mobility and stuff like that and i really feel like i'm recovering and uh yeah i mean obviously as an athlete you also try to eat the right things. I think um, eating healthy is very important to recover well. And um, after so many years in a, as an athlete, I think I also know my body quite well and know when I should train less or more, which is something I think is is very important um, 
uh, to learn as an athlete, like really getting to know your body, you know? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'm going to switch gears here away from that because we've mostly been talking about your wins in this conversation so far. We've been talking about like all the things that you've crushed this uh, year. I like talking about winning. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about Sleepwalker. That was that. That's really interesting to me. You've tried a lot of routes, and it seems like this was the first time you've gone on a trip with a specific goal and walked away empty-handed. And I mean, you know, you walking away empty-handed is you still sending some V14s and stuff. So it wasn't like you did nothing on that trip. But that was your main goal. You tried it a lot. You did really well, but you didn't do it. Um, tell me about that experience and what you learned from that. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely really true. And I mean, even now, I'm still not sure like why I sucked so hard that trip basically i would say um uh or or at least i i just didn't do the boulder um uh, but yeah it was it was very interesting and it really i think it did teach me especially things about like projecting a boulder uh because it was also the first time i projected a boulder problem like before that i don't think there was a boulder that i didn't do within like two or three days or i would just try it and give up on it or something but i wouldn't um tried for multiple days so i think that was the first time i actually tried a boulder for multiple days and i really wanted to finish it and um it is very different to a route uh, for sure like especially like a longer route and it's mentally different uh, all those things and then uh yeah i think it also helped me now once i tried alfane like uh especially for bouldering even more than for lead i think skin is just something crazy crazy important you know like uh skin management i mean it's also something that's really important for competitions but if you want to excuse me if you want to um send something on your limit um and yeah even more so for bouldering uh you need like really good skin um and i think for sleepwalker i definitely made some tactical errors in that regard i remember like the basically the full last week of the trip, I would always had to climb with tapes or just yolo it with a split, you know, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, and probably start bleeding during the try, uh, which really sucked. And all that only happened because I was too greedy and did too many days on, or like mm. didn't rest enough, or things like that. Um, I mean, obviously, I was also really struggling with the conditions. That's like another part, but that's something that you can't control as much, I would say. Uh, it was just crazy cold, that trip, and I already have dry skin, and it was just really, really dry. And I, I think um, I didn't manipulate my skin and everything well enough to, to cope with those conditions. Mm. But I think after all, still, like, I would never like, I don't want to like whine about conditions and all that things. I think it mattered, but I think I definitely, because I was also not in bad shape or anything. That was also not the problem. I think I had what it takes to do the boulder and I kind of failed um, because I made some like, yeah, tactical errors, but also um, uh, some, I would say like I mentally failed as well. Like mm. I, I remember doing like the crux move twice on the sloper and then failing to get the little crack, which I, if I do as a single move was never a problem. So uh, it was just hard for me, like projecting a boulder. I got nervous when I did like the hard move and I was not um, ex as experienced in those situations as, as I would have imagined to be as like such an experienced lead climber. So mm. uh, it was really interesting and I learned quite a bit. And it's a boulder I really want to go back to because yeah. uh, like we were talking about BIG, it's it's, it's unfinished business. And, uh, you know, it's um, my big goal as climber is not just like sending V17 or 9C or whatever. It's to be the best possible climber that I could possibly be, you know, mm. whether it be physical or mentally. Um, I just want to learn, learn, learn. And if there's like a boulder that I failed on, then I have to return because it seems like I wasn't good at that boulder. So I really want to do Sleepwalker. Mm. That's such a good mindset. Like that thing, I failed on that thing. So it's got something to teach me. So I'm going back. That's really cool. Sure. I think it's really interesting that you use the word greedy. 
um, you were too greedy. You didn't take enough rest days. You were greedy. Like that's very specific. And I'd never thought about it that way before you said it, but it resonates with me. I know that feeling of like, I know I should probably be more, because I've used the word patient. Like I should be more patient. I got impatient because I wanted to do this thing. But it is more than that. It's like, oh, I want it. Like maybe I can squeak it out, you know, yeah. w- without taking extra rest or or whatever else or um, really listening to what my body's telling me For and sure. honor I that. Mean, yeah. I think so, yeah. I think there is like two parts to it. Like sometimes you're like greedy or also like impatient of just like finally getting the beta dialed so you can do ghosts, you know? You know totally. that feeling when you're like yep. sometimes, especially in lead routes, like you have just gotten the beta on all the hard part and now you just got this five meter slap to do and okay you you expect it to be easy so you just want to quickly find the beta up but then because you have that mindset it takes forever and you're like so upset because you're so impatient because you finally want to have the beta and just do tries um but then there's also obviously yeah the like the greedy perspective of like just being able to send it in like a couple of days like uh and that's also i was definitely with sleepwalker i feel like I was also overconfident. Um, like I expected myself to do it like in a couple of days and then have time to try some other boulders, you know? Uh, so that's also where the greed comes in. Like mm. I got to do it. Like I got to figure it out now. Cause like, yeah, come on. What, what the hell is working? What the hell is going on with me? And mm. I, I should be strong enough to get the beta dialed on my third day in or something. And then I should send it on my fourth fourth day or whatever you know uh and then you're trying it way too much and you're like hurting your skin way too much and all those things Mm -hmm. totally yeah that that all really resonates um what's the takeaway so you're gonna go back um what do you feel like you've learned and what are you gonna do differently next time I mean, I'm not sure when I'm going back, but I'm definitely going back at some point. It's also like Red Rocks is just a really cool area. And um, even though Vegas feels like a different planet, it's still <laughs> fun sometimes, yeah. I feel like. Yeah. Um, and uh, But yeah, I mean, I definitely know a bit more about the boulder now, maybe try to prepare a bit more for it. But also, mostly I really hope that uh, the conditions matter a lot as well. So I think I would definitely go at a different time period maybe when it's like a little bit warmer because it for my taste it was just way too cold i think it was some of the coldest climbing days i've ever had i remember Mm. like trying the boulder in like the biggest down jacket because um now i know that this boulder it somehow is like at that spot it's somehow like feels like the coldest spot in Mm. all red rocks because there's always the wind coming through uh so i think that would already be like a big step just going there when it's like a little bit warmer and then also, yeah, maybe trying it with someone else who's good at the boulder and trying to learn from him a bit on some of the moves moves that I struggled on. Because I remember I especially struggled on the star traverse um, on the underclinks, not even as much on the on the hard move, but more on like the traverse where most people I'm talking to are like, ah, oh, what really? It's not that hard. So yeah, I don't mm. know. That's something I feel like I should learn better. And um, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, let me see if I have any other questions about about Sleepwalker. I don't think I do. Um, I want to talk to you about who you're most impressed by. I think we should wrap up with this, and then I've got a handful of questions for you from listeners that we can um, we can do in a little bonus segment uh, before I let you go here. But I want to ask who you've been most impressed by that you've climbed with, and what what was it about them that was so impressive? And before hearing your response, I want to tell you a little story. So um, I've spoken to Drew Ruana on the podcast a number of times, and um, I knew I knew him from back in the day at Smith Rock, and he's now become one of the strongest boulders in the world. He's climbed like, I don't know, 10 V16s or something. And he's told me this story twice, like once in person way back in uh, at Smith, and then he told it on the podcast uh, in the Drew Ruana Cam Hurst episode. Um, but I asked him who he's been most impressed by. And he told the story of he was 18 years old. He was training at um, uh, Kletter's Entrum in Innsbruck. And he was, oh, yeah. you know, climbing on that huge spray wall that you guys have. And you showed up. And I think this is this is how I remember it. I think your coach set a, um, a circuit for you. It was like 20 moves long. 
and you flashed it. And then Drew spent, you know, he was already an incredibly good climber, like, you know, 9A, 9A plus uh, root climber. And uh, he tried it for like the whole entire trip that he was there. And by the end of the trip, he'd only linked like the first six moves. And he was just like, you know, mind blown. He's like, I can't, I was the strongest kid back home. And now I travel across the world and like, oh, wow, this is what a real professional looks like. Um, and that story stuck with him ever since. So I think that's, I think that's pretty fun. Um, but that do you awesome. have that? I had to ask you the same thing. Do you have that person? Like, have you had those moments where you climb with someone and you're like, you're just like, holy shit, I can't believe how good or how strong or how tactical or, or whatever it is. But, um, who, who's impressed you the most? I mean, yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel very honored that such a strong climber like Drew has like th had this moment with me. So that's, that's pretty sick. I would love to challenge him again in Kai. I hope he comes by sometime. I've actually been in contact with him. So I think at some point he's finally coming to Europe and uh, I really want to team up with him on, on some, some boulders outside. Also, nice. yeah, it'll be cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously there's, I think, I mean, we have talked about this before. I think, um, it's very important as a climber or as an athlete to be inspired by, by other climbers. Cause there's always like climbing is so crazy diverse like it's impossible to the to be the best at everything it's just it's impossible um uh, so there will always be some things where someone else is better than you and i think it's very important to try to learn from them and like um yeah uh try to get better at it as well and work on your weaknesses and there have definitely been people obviously inspiring me in like a lot of things so, like i would definitely say like i said before the person that inspired me the most uh, is Adam Andra. I've just like spent a lot of time with him climbing and I've often, yeah, it's not just his climbing, but it's just his psych for climbing. It's just crazy. Like if you have mm -hmm. never met him, you can't like uh, understand what I mean, but like there is no one more excited about climbing than Adam. And that's just so amazing. And it really makes you like whenever you meet him and you talk about climbing you're like even more psyched you know um because he's just such a psych climber um and i think that's also pretty inspirational but then there's also like a moment that i just had uh with alfane for example if we want to talk about someone else because uh, like i said i studied a lot of videos of all the people that did alfane and i think the way that will bosey did alfane was just so impressive to me in the video like i remember like now talking to like Aiden and Sean that also were there following his process, it was, it's like a bit more re in re relativity or in relation. Um, like I understand it a bit more, but just seeing his video for the first time and how he cruised, especially for the first five moves. Like I told you, how I struggled on the first few moves a long time. So when I watched this video, I was just like, I just couldn't get it, like how that's even possible to <laughs> wow. just cruise through those first few moves. It was just mind blowing to me. Mm. Um, and then Aiden and Sean told me he was actually also struggling on the first few moves for a while at mm. the start, which was not believable if you watch the video. Uh, but still, how he did Alfane or the way he climbed it, it was really impressive to me. You know, there's sometimes there's just this, it's not just how someone climbs, but it's this performances where mm. you, the person has like a performance of their lifetime almost, or like, I don't know, they have like this just crazy flow all of a sudden. And like, if we talk about comps, I remember because last year uh, there was the World Cup in Chamonix and uh, I was not there, but I was watching the comp and Sam Avesu, um, a French climber who is not a lead specialist, I would say. He was always also really good in bouldering. He had this climb in the final route, which really impressed me because it looked like he tried the route like 10 times already, you know? Wow. Um, he just flowed through the route. Like he climbed it like multiple times already. And that's just really, really hard to do on an onside. So there is multiple of those occasions where I think I get inspired or where I'm like, wow, that was just this, that was crazy. Um, and that's, yeah, that's the cool thing about climbing. And I think that's also what makes us psyched mm. to to have those moments ourselves. <laughs> well, I appreciate you, man. It's awesome to hear, um, 
you know, some of the behind the scenes of this amazing year you have, you've, you've had, but what's really standing out to me from meeting you for the first time in this conversation and talking to you is that you're just a student of climbing. You want to become the best version of yourself and you're willing to learn from everybody and everything. And, that's that's such an inspiring mindset. I think that's um, you know it's it's easy to imagine that there's um, co- you know competition between all the top guys and um, egos between the top guys, but you just seem so down to earth. You seem like you just love climbing and really enjoy spending time with these other amazing athletes and learning from them. And um, that's such a good model to set for the rest of us. We can we can all draw inspiration from that. So I really appreciate it. I want to congratulate you again on such an amazing year. And thank you so much for your time. Um, I've really loved this conversation. And for people listening, stick around. Patrons, we're going to dive into a couple more topics and a few of your questions to wrap up. Then we're going to let this guy go so he can get onto his photo shoot (laughs) what time is it there it's already it's almost eight o'clock at night so yeah you're you've got a packed schedule yeah today's today's packed but it's it's just one of those days usually my schedule is much better (laughs) right on yeah well i appreciate you man thank you so much for doing this 